Today discussing the subject of uh, uh, general custom or orf. I'll be just looking at the meaning and definition uh, of orf, uh, its varieties, its relationship with the sunnah, general consensus, fatwa and ijtihad and whether there is any proof in the Quran and Sunnah in support of Orf uh, and uh, its application in modern law. Literally, uh, Orf in Arabic uh, means uh, it is derived from the root word Arafa, to know. And uh, Orf is that which is known and familiar. In the Quran we have and the word uh, urf used also ma'roof, that which is known and recommended. Um, there is a parallel word uh, to urf, and that is ada. Ada is uh, used interchangeably with urf, but there is a little difference in the sense that uh, Ada can be used in reference to both individual and communities to say that this is the custom or Ada of Ahmad or of uh, the community in, uh, in Australia. When you say Orf, you refer to a multitude. This is the Orf of that community. You don't say this is the Orf of Ahmad. But uh, this uh, a difference in mind, uh, the ulama have uh, almost used uh, orf and other interchangeably. And the definition of uh, custom or orf is that it is a, a recurrent practice uh, that is reasonable and acceptable to the people of sound nature. Uh, Recurring practices means that it is regularly practiced and it is very well known and it is reasonable uh, and acceptable. If something is unreasonable, irrational, or it is harmful and prejudicial, it does not qualify the meaning or the definition of Urf. We have uh, in the Quran of this expression very frequently occurring. Amr bil ma'roof, commanding that which is good and, and uh, recommended. Uh, this uh, derives from the same root, but as I will discuss, there is some difficulty. The ulama do not seem to accept uh, urf in the same uh, open spirit as other legal traditions do. And there is a reason for it. Despite the fact that we have in the Quran a passage in Surah 7, Ayah 199, uh, which says, Take to forgiveness, command that which is according to custom, and turn away from the ignorant. Uh, the majority of scholars. Uh, say that Urf in this verse me, m, implies its literal di dictionary meaning. It's not a reference to the custom of society. Uh, although there is disagreement on this, Al Qarafi from the Maliki school that says that this is a text. This is a text in the Quran on the authority of custom as a source of law in judgment. But because of its instability in the fact that custom sometimes is changeable, and also to see this meaning, take to forgiveness, command that which is according to custom. Uh, this is uh, not the reading of uh, that the jurist has offered. Command that which is good, which is familiar, and which is recommendable not necessarily that which is uh, in accordance with custom. Custom can sometimes be misguided, it may be changeable. The Sharia cannot subjugate itself to the dictates of our. That is the understanding. In our, and uh, <coughs> uh, despite these reservations, and I will elaborate this further, we have 
several legal maxims that are, reco that are recorded in the Mujalla, the Ottoman Mujalla. For example, uh, the Ada is a basis of judgment. Al Ada tu muhakkamatu. That is, custom is the basis of judgment. In another legal maxim, we read what is proven by custom is like that which is proven by the text. As sabitu bil urfi, kasabit bin nas. And uh, in reality, custom, general custom, and urf has played an important role in the development of Islamic law, in the development of fatwa, in ijtihad, even in the interpretation of the Quran. For example, uh, in Surah 65, verse 7, uh, and there is a verse which reads that وَلْيُنْفِقْ ذُو سَعَةٍ مِنْ سَعَةٍ Let one who can afford to spend by way of nafaka. Nafaka that is support and maintenance to close relatives. Uh, now the Quran makes a general reference that nafaka or maintenance is a requirement, but the quantity of how much is given to each particular relative, this is something that is determined by reference to the general custom. And the formulation of ishtihad, even in changing the existing fatwa in ishtihad, custom has played a role. We know, for example, that Imam Shafi established two schools when he was uh, in Baghdad the old school. Then in the last five years of his life he traveled to Egypt and then gradually, gradually he found that the earlier uh, rulings that he had issued uh, were so different in, in accordance with the custom of Egypt to contextualize those rulings with the custom of Egypt. He changes a great deal of his earlier rulings and fatwas. Then also custom, uh, the Arab custom, custom of the Arab society has played an important role in the embodiment of the Sunnah of the Prophet, especially a variety of the Sunnah known as tacitly approved Sunnah or Sunnah Taqririya. Um, the Prophet overruled the kind of Arab custom that was uh, contrary to the spirit of Islam, prejudicial and oppressive, but many of the customary practices also survived and he did not oppose to it and it gradually became part of the, uh, the tacitly approved Sunnah of the Prophet. Even after the Prophet's demise, the companions uh, often said, we used to do such and such during the life time of the Prophet. And this is a reference again that this was something, a customary practice that the Prophet himself did not object to. It becomes authoritative. And some aspects of the Arab custom have survived. For example, uh, the Aqila. The Aqila that plays the close relative and kinsman, tribal uh, tribal within the context of tribes and clans that tribesmen paid the blood money on behalf of the person uh, who committed an offense uh, from among them. It was something a collective responsibility of the clan and tribe to pay compensation for the crime uh, of one of its members. It was almost like establishing a social control that people must not commit crime. That was uh, also taken and became part of the Sharia. There are certain transactions, mortgage for example, uh, the forward sale of salam in the rule of kafa'a that requires equality in marriage between the two prospective spouses. These were also customary during the lifetime of the Prophet and he approved them and became part of the fiqh and sharia of Islam. And then in the law of inheritance, we find that the importance of the male uh, line of descent, that is the agnatic 
relative the asava they uh, become a part of reference a, a point of reference in the entitlement uh, to shares in the law of inheritance and this was also customary in arab societies the maliki doctrine that we have the practice of the people of medina is also a reference to the importance of amal the practice of the people of medina in so many ways we find that custom has influenced ishtihad the rules of consensus in ijma in what we consider to be uh, our public interest but in order for custom to be a valid basis of law in judgment it must fulfill certain conditions what are those conditions first that the custom must be recurrent in dominant regularly practiced and known to everyone in society if it is not recurrent if some isolated few people know about it and practice it others don't it would not qualify as custom and this is clearly stated in one the, the article article 14 of of the majalla ottoman majalla uh, all of this is actually can be consulted in my book uh, there is a chapter on uh, on custom page uh, 369 to 382 the detail can be consulted similarly in everyday transactions when we for example buy or sell a house or a car uh, what is exactly included in the house or in a car when you buy or not included this is determined by general custom of society and people if there are two particular two varieties of customs on the same point uh, practiced by a community for example two types of currencies and you write a document and you do not specify then we refer to the one which is more recurrent is more dominant that would be um, the way to specify uh, second condition is that it must the custom we uh, must be in existence at the time a certain transaction or contract is uh, concluded uh, then uh, it applies uh, to those transactions but uh, documents and transactions that were concluded before the recognition or coming about of a particular custom would not fall under that particular custom in other words the custom must exist in order to be applicable to transactions the interpretation of contracts and documents we must know that that particular custom existed at the time a third condition that custom must fulfill is that it must not con- contravene the rules or the provisions of contract in agreement explicit uh, provisions of uh, agreement in contract among individual uh, prevail over customary practice for example there is a legal maxim that a contract is the sharia of the contracting parties al aqd shari'atu al aqdain if we have for example in the payment of dowry in marriage if the custom is such that you pay half now in half on a later occasion this is but the contract of marriage provide that the the dowry must all be paid at the time of the contract then this would prevail and not the existing custom about that matter uh and uh, lastly the condition that custom must fulfill that it must not be contrary to the text in the injunctions of the sharia uh, for example uh, usury or riba may be current may be widely practiced as it is in fact very widely practiced in the banking in finance world but since there is a clear text that it is prohibited in the quran uh, then uh, uh, it cannot be accepted a custom in order to be accepted must not violate the clear dictates or mandate of a text um if for example that 
the conflict between text and, and, uh, and custom may be total, as in the example of riba, or it may be partial. If it is a partial conflict, then custom is allowed actually to limit the application of the text uh, as a specifier of the text. We have, for example, in the hadith on the subject of forward sale or salam, uh, that the Prophet uh, forbade uh, the sale of that which does not exist at the time of transaction. Uh, but he uh, made a concession with reference to salam. Uh, he permitted, uh, he prohibited the sale of what is non-existent. But in forward sale, the item, the subject matter does not exist. Mm, now we come to another contract, that is uh, manufacturing contract or istisna. In a manufacturing contract, when you order a house to be made for you, the house does not exist at the time, and you don't even pay for it uh, all the price. So both of the counter values are none. Since there is now a partial conflict, then we say that the custom of society has accepted the contract of istisna, manufacturing contract, and it therefore uh, apply, limits the application of the text. We accept what is said in the hadith, but we make uh, ex exception with reference to these contracts. When you appoint a wakil or a, a representative to represent you in the purchase of a house, you do not specify his limits of authority. But the custom does limit his authority. He cannot buy that house for you for double the kind of customary price. So custom actually limits uh, the text and the authority of uh, the rules, application of the rules of Sharia. Uh, I now just briefly differentiate uh, custom in ijma, general consensus uh, in ijma are two different concepts, although they relate to one another and there are common points. Firstly, that consensus is the prerogative only of the learned, the mujtahid, whereas uh, urf uh, is uh, for all society, laymen and jurists all included. The other is that uh, custom has a con element of continuity. Over time it continues, whereas ijma can come about instantaneously if the ulama determine uh, such. In continuity is not a requirement. The other is that custom is changeable, uh, whereas ijma, once finalized, ijma is not likely to be subject to change. The types of custom. There are about six varieties of custom or orf that uh, are discussed in the fiqh literature. And they are simple varieties. Firstly, uh, the verbal in the actual custom. Verbal custom refers to the dictionary use of words. Sometimes words are used by people with a different meaning to that uh, of its different, of their different dictionary meaning. When we say, for example, swalat, zakat, hajj, uh, prayer, charity, a pilgrimage, these are used in their customary meaning, by, not by their literal meaning, because literally swalat means prayer, zakat means uh, purification, hajj means a visit. But when we use these, the customary usage of these is generally accepted and it suppresses the literal meaning of these words. Sometimes in the Quran it's the opposite. Uh, for example, the Quran uses laham, the word meat, in reference to fish, whereas customarily the uh, Arabs uh, do not uh, use the uh, word laham to apply, to imply fish, samak is used. 
if you um, pronounce a statement, make a statement that I will not set foot in the house of so and so, and you go uh, and literally put your step in the in the door, and you take an oath uh, that you will not do so, are you uh, are you responsible in? Uh, have you broken your oath by simply putting your foot? No, customarily when people say I will not set foot, it means to enter the house, not literally to put your So here you have all the example that the verbal examples of verbal custom. Uh, then actual custom. Actual custom uh, is uh, that which is uh, custom by practice by people in reference to the payment of dawah, for example. Customarily, half of it is paid at the time of marriage, half of it is paid later. That is actual custom. Um, then uh, another variety is general custom and specific. General custom is that which is universally applied. Like by al ta'ati, the give and take sale. You go to the supermarket and to Places you put your money and take the object without pronouncing the uh, offer in acceptance. This is customarily accepted. Uh, this is general custom and it prevails over the specifics of contract. Uh, then we have uh, specific or particular custom which are applied uh, in communities, in trades and professions, the lawyers, for example, the stockbrokers, they have their own customary practices. Generally speaking, it is a general custom uh, that is authoritative and prevails over the normal rules of qiyas and fiqh. But there is a substantive body of opinion that both uh, general and specific custom are authoritative. And the last variety is um, valid custom and invalid custom. Sahih, orf sahih, and orf fasid. Sahih is that which is not contrary to Sharia or to the principles of Islam, as we said, with reference to the payment of dawah. That is not objectionable. But uh, custom may be objectionable from the viewpoint of Sharia. In tribal societies, women are deprived of their share in inheritance, despite the fact that the Sharia gives them a share. This is a corrupt custom. It's not acceptable. It's, it's facile. Um, is there a proof in, uh, to tell us in the Quran and Sunnah that custom is a source of judgment, of law and judgment? The jurists have referred to verses to, uh, in Surah 22, verse 78 and that Allah does not intend to impose hardship upon you or to make religion as a means of inflicting hardship. This is used as an authority and a textual authority for all because what if you uh, reject and violate or uh, and deny its validity is likely to cause hardship to the people and therefore it is subsumed by this verse and not the verse I earlier quoted take to forgiveness and command or and turn away from the ignorant uh, this, uh, there is some disagreement that when we when the Quran mentions orf in ma'roof, it means that which is acceptable to the Sharia, which is good, which is familiar, and not necessarily that which people practice. A hadith is quoted that one, what the Muslims uh, sees to be good, is good in the eyes of God. مَا رَآهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ حَسَنًا فَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ حَسَنًا That it is good in the eyes of God. And uh, <clears throat> um, despite on the authority that we find in the wide role that custom plays in society, in the formulation of fiqh, in the sunnah, in other areas of sharia, yet uh, the ulama have uh, actually not given it the space, the recognition 
that it, um, it uh, in reality it merits. Uh, this is uh, because uh, the Sharia, there are two authority, sources of authority. One is divine revelation, that is the command and will of Allah. The other is Urf, that is the will and command of the people. Uh, we recognize the first as the higher authority, although we do uh, mm, uh, acknowledge a certain role, but not without some reservations and limits. In modern times, uh, the custom has become a little less stable. Societies have become mobile, people move, frequent mobility affects the stability of the custom. The other factor that uh, also influences that uh, the affairs of society, law, in government is dictated and regulated by statutory legislation. In the rule, the space left for ORF is becoming increasingly limited. But uh, ORF has played a role even in the change of fatwa. Sometimes the ulama, as I earlier said, at one time and that for oh, those who taught the Quran, for example, the Hanafi mazhab and other mazahib and did not entitle the teacher of the Quran to, to a fee. We, they thought this is a spiritual something that made spiritual reward. It does not necessarily to be paid uh, for. But later it was known that people would not teach it unless there was some kind of payment. And then the ulama changed that fatwa and accepted that uh, the Quran teaching is may be paid for. Also, when we uh, look, uh, when we mention the word fraud or rabban in fiqh, that uh, it is prohibited, but what exactly can, uh, it is? Rabban is, or fraudulent dealing is often determined by reference to society, uh, to the practice of people. And I think there are other examples that I have used in my uh, chapter that I conclude my discussion of the subject of ORF.